Good evening, my name is Steve, and on tonight's video program, we'll be transported back to 1998, a very significant year for severe weather across the world, including the F5 downtown Birmingham tornado, as well as the F3 downtown Nashville tornado, and this particularly odd tornado outbreak occurring just a few weeks later. Enjoy. High-risk days cause an absolute frenzy in the weather community. On your average high-risk day, Ryan Hall is probably streaming for over 12 hours straight. Reed Timmer is out there dominating, adding a few more dents to his Forester. And hopefully the people within those high-risk zones are prepared for the severe weather to come. A high-risk weather event is the highest threat level issued by the Storm Prediction Center for convective weather events here in the US. Convective just meaning the vertical transport of heat and moisture, AKA storms. High risks are saved for days where a great potential for life-threatening severe weather exists, and thus there have only been 157 high risks issued since 1982. I spent some time mapping out every high-risk polygon since 1982, and the resulting data set is visually very interesting. These are all the high-risk polygons issued in the 1980s, these are the 1990s, these are the 2000s, and these are 2010 to 2022. Now you probably noticed something right off the bat. Between the 1990s and the 2000s, forecasting technology and severe weather science in general improved dramatically. This coupled with the fact that the National Weather Service wanted to get much more specific with the language used in said warnings led to much smaller and much more accurate high-risk polygons. It's pretty wild how large these areas were in the 1980s compared to the 2000s. This trend only continued throughout the 2010s and with the implementation of the marginal and enhanced risk categories in 2010, which expanded the risk levels from 3 to 5. High risks peaked in the 1990s with 64 and have since been on a decline. When we look at all 157 risk polygons together, the result is a bit messy, but you can get a good idea where most of the severe weather happens in the United States. Except I lied. You see, there are only 156 polygons shown here. The final one, issued on May 31st, 1998, is located right here. This is the only high risk ever issued in the northeastern United States, and today we're going to find out what the heck happened in upstate New York. Before we start this long video, it may be beneficial for you to get out your blank weather bingo card, fill it out with 25 random severe weather phenomena, and see if you get a bingo by the end of this video. 1998 had an unfortunate history of tornadoes hitting major cities. Earlier in the year, an F5 went through the western suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama, killing 32. Just two weeks later, an F3 tornado trekked through downtown Nashville, damaging several of the city's skyscrapers and hundreds of homes. Funnily enough, Texas and Oklahoma were actually seeing a bit of a tornado drought throughout April and May. But by late May, the upper atmosphere was carefully crafting the most outrageous weather setup yet. At 500 millibars, or about 18,000 feet in the atmosphere, you had two areas of low pressure, one way up north over the Hudson Bay and one over Northern California. Now, right below this jet streak could be a recipe for disaster because generally when air diverges aloft, it converges and rises at the surface. Speaking of, at the surface, we would be looking for warm, moist air coming out of the south. And wouldn't you know it, we got a lot of that. Eastern Kansas and Nebraska were seeing both temperatures and dew points right around 70 by 6 a.m., with some dense fog as well. Now, would that warm air be able to spin if it rose into a thunderstorm? Absolutely, take a look at this wind shear, nearly a 90 degree turn between the surface and 500 millibars, about 18,000 feet high. So indeed, supercells with rotating updrafts were possible late in the day on May 30th. The Storm Prediction Center saw this extreme instability and issued a moderate risk for this area to the east of Sioux Falls. South Dakota was only under a slight risk, but this was upgraded to a moderate risk at 4.35 a.m. on the 30th. But that's not the only threat that this system posed. This warm front that extended from the low separated the warm moist air to the south from cooler, drier air to the north. And as this low pressure and associated cold front would progress to the east, this front would remain relatively stationary over the next 12 hours. 
Above the front, this jet streak was moving from west to east with multiple embedded shortwave troughs, that's the little divots in the isobars shown here. This created a massive area of instability directly east of the low. This is a setup that's favorable to durations, both progressive and serial. If you want to learn more about those, you should watch my in-depth video of the Ohio fireworks derecho of 1969. But in short, progressive derechos ride parallel to stationary fronts, and serial derechos move with cold fronts. What often gets lost in today's climate is that weather is not black and white, and derechos aren't either, which is why the hybrid derecho exists. You can have a derecho that rides along a stationary front, but is also propelled by an extremely fast-moving cold front. This was definitely an option on May 30th and 31st. So with this setup in mind, let's review the possibilities here. Several discrete supercells would probably form in South Dakota, which may or may not produce tornadoes. These supercells would then likely congeal into a line, which would likely move east as a derecho, either progressive, serial, or hybrid, and travel through the night at high speed. By the morning of the 31st, the cold front would be located over the Great Lakes, and a new warm front would form along the boundary in upstate New York. This would cause a similar setup in the northeast with enough warmth, moisture, and lift for a derecho, enough to wind shear for tornadoes, and enough concern for the National Weather Service to issue the first ever high risk for the Northeast, covering a large area of upstate New York. That's the setup. Let's see how it unfolds. There was a ton of moisture associated with the system, so there were large swaths of heavy rain extending from South Dakota to Michigan all night into the morning of the 30th. But all that remained was thin cirrus clouds in eastern South Dakota, and by 2.30 p.m. a couple severe thunderstorms along the cold front were moving into western South Dakota. Cape values exceeded 4,000 joules per kilogram that afternoon, that is a lot. And by 3.33 p.m., the Storm Prediction Center issued a severe thunderstorm watch to the north of I-90, and then a tornado watch 17 minutes later as the dry line approached. As we talked about in the Heston video, the dry line is the mechanism needed to force the warm surface air through the layer of drier, cooler air above. At 5 p.m., storms started firing along the dry line, and at 6.45 p.m., the first storm went severe in Beetle County. These were all discrete supercells, and if any significant tornadoes were to occur this day, it would be from these storms in southern South Dakota within the next couple of hours. Storm chaser Bill Reed, currently in Cirrostratus covered northern Nebraska, realized this was the case and beelined north up I-29. Bill had a front row seat to what was about to happen and he gave me permission to share his video and story with you all. At 7.55 p.m., a funnel cloud was reported in northeastern Davidson County. And six minutes later, the first tornado warning was issued for Hanson County to the east. Two short-lived tornadoes were produced by the storm in Hanson County to the north of Fulton. Then, at 8.13 p.m., a large funnel was reported to the east of the town of Mitchell. It was at this point the Storm Prediction Center issued a PDS tornado watch, or particularly dangerous situation. Several more reports of this tornado came through the forecasting office within the next 10 minutes, and by 8.32, it became clear that this large tornado was headed east-southeast towards Spencer, a railroad town of about 315 people. Meanwhile, Bill was racing west down Route 38, unable to see the tornado. However, as soon as as he passed this particular tree line, the large funnel came into view. The tornado, less than 10 miles away from his location, was intensifying and turning slightly to the right, heading directly for the center of Spencer. Bill was not the only storm chaser out that day. Josh Warman, driving a Dow or Doppler radar unit on the back of a truck, was a few miles to the west of Bill on Route 38, scanning the storm as it approached Spencer. And the resulting imagery is quite incredible. We are able to see details in both reflectivity and velocity products of this hook echo that you would never see otherwise. Winds were well over 200 miles an hour, between 50 and 100 feet off the ground. The new tornado warning for McCook County was broadcasted at 8.33 p.m., and five minutes later, with Bill watching a few miles to the east, the town of Spencer was obliterated. There's something very eerie about listening to Killdeer call without a care in the world while an F4 is changing lives forever a few miles away. These images taken by Roger Edwards of the Storm Prediction Center showed the worst of the damage. On the western side of town, several farmhouses were destroyed. 
The tornado then took out the Spencer water tower as well as wiped out the fire station. A grain processing facility was also destroyed. An apartment building housing elderly residents completely collapsed, resulting in five of the six fatalities. The tornado was close to half a mile wide when it hit Spencer and was on the ground a total of 21 miles before lifting. The final rating was F4 on the Fujita scale, and it damaged about 170 of the 195 structures in town, injured 150 people, and caused $18 million in damage. Unfortunately, this was just the start of a very long 36 hours. The supercell that produced the Spencer tornado occurred ahead and south of a young squall line, and the supercell was absorbed into the line half an hour later. The storm produced two weaker tornadoes during this time, and then the discrete supercells were gone. What was left was a fast-moving line of severe storms with large hail being propelled by a blazing cold front and 100 mile an hour wind gusts. Throughout its entire existence, the counties immediately ahead of the derecho were placed under a tornado watch, because at any moment a spin-up QLCS tornado could occur within the violent line. Between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m., it tore through the southern half of Minnesota. An 81 mile an hour gust was measured in Dakota County. Hundreds of boats in lakes across the state were overturned, but the worst damage was in McLeod and Sibley counties. Half a million customers lost power and tens of thousands of trees were blown down. Across the state, the derecho injured 22 people and caused $48 million in damage. At around midnight central, the derecho entered southwestern Wisconsin at peak intensity. Between Wisconsin Dells and Milwaukee, a corridor of microbursts caused damage similar to an EF2 tornado, with the top measured wind gust of 128 miles an hour recorded near Watertown, as well as gust over 100 miles an hour in the Milwaukee metro area. It's important to note here that the wind gust gusts of that magnitude were just that, gusts. They only lasted for about 60 seconds or so, and before and after, the sustained wind speed was anywhere from 40 to 80 miles an hour. But it only takes a couple seconds of 120 mile an hour wind gusts to rip the roof off of your home or to damage trees, which is how these 120 mile an hour gusts damaged several small planes at a county airport. Additionally, they knocked out power to 250,000 residents and significantly damaged 500 buildings. Seven small tornadoes occurred within the small line, the strongest being a short lived F2 near Menominee, injuring eight. A barn in Hollandale was pushed with its foundation eight inches to the east. East. Several thousand residents had to be evacuated from South Milwaukee when a tree fell onto a propane tank. Finally, at 3.30 a.m. Central, the derecho had left Wisconsin, leaving behind $56 million of structural damage as well as $1.5 million in crop and livestock loss. Now, some people might think that a derecho moving over a large body of water would be preferable to a derecho moving over land. Nobody really lives on water unless you live in a houseboat, and that just means that there are less people in the path of the thing. While that is true, oftentimes the Great Lakes can actually accelerate derechos. Water provides a lot less friction than land, and this can actually cause the derecho to gain speed and intensify. In this case, by the time the derecho exited Lake Michigan, it was moving at over 70 miles an hour. The resulting wind can then be funneled into concave shorelines, thereby locally increasing the wind speed and causing incredible damage. Not only that, but a derecho show can cause a lake seiche, where the water is physically pushed by the wind from one end of the lake to the other. The resulting early morning seiche ultimately sank a tugboat that was traveling on a channel to Lake Michigan. The combined result was a night of historic destruction for southern Michigan. At 4.45 a.m. Eastern Time, the derecho made landfall on the eastern shores of Lake Michigan. An intense downburst occurred right along the gust front on the leading edge of the storm and delivered a 130 mile an hour punch to Ottawa County. Several condominiums in Spring Lake were leveled. Dozens of trailers were rolled on their side. To the east in Walker, many roofs were ripped off of their homes, as well as the roof and outer wall of this Ford dealership. To the north, Muskegon State Park was inaccessible due to the sheer number of downed trees. At County Estates Mobile Home Park, trees collapsed onto several of the homes, as well as Judy Carlisle's brand new GMC Suburban she had just brought home the day before. To the east in Coral, Andy Peterson was wild turkey hunting early in the morning when the storm hit, and he was one of the few people who were outside filming during this derecho. There were many residents in western Michigan that complained that the storm hit without warning, which really just means that the sirens didn't sound because it was a severe thunderstorm warning and not a tornado warning, and it hit in the middle of the night. We'll talk more about this later as there have been a few key updates to the National Weather Service warning system since 1998. 
To the east in Bay City, dozens of trees fell on houses and a billboard was folded like a pretzel. The physical clock in the South Tower was also MIA. In Michigan alone, the storm killed four, injured 146, and caused $172 million in damages. By 8 a.m. Eastern, the derecho had crossed into Ontario, Canada, and weakened considerably, still producing $300,000 in damages. But this is when the attention turned towards the day ahead. The warm front that had stretched over the Great Lakes the day before was now pushing northeast over upstate New York, and the atmosphere was destabilizing near Albany. At the surface, warm, moist air surged into the area with temperatures approaching 90 by 2 p.m. High in the atmosphere, a jet streak was approaching from the west, and the air from this jet streak was diverging aloft. A decent amount of wind shear was present as storm relative helicity values were between 400 and 800, which are very high values. To top it all off, the cool air from the gust front of the dying derecho was now moving towards the Adirondacks, which was now acting as sort of a dry line, which would help shrink the zone where supercells were likely to form. The environment was a powder keg filled with every type of firework, and whichever one went off first would likely dominate the others. Obviously, the Storm Prediction Center saw this and acted accordingly, issuing the first ever and only high risk in the northeastern United States. At around 2.30 p.m., the dying derecho from the night before entered the moisture-rich environment and greatly intensified near Ithaca. A couple discrete supercells formed to the east of the line and quickly intensified, dropping considerable hail south of I-90 in Montgomery County. But the squall line to the west was moving at blazing fast speeds, and by 4.15 p.m. the two lines of storms had merged. It was at this time that the supercell, once discrete and now embedded in the line, dropped a tornado west of Mechanicville, quickly intensifying into an F3 multiple vortex tornado. It continued east hitting the DeSienna Furniture Company. It then plowed through the Vile Hill neighborhood, a residential area on the northern side of Mechanicville. Houses in this area were devastated, losing their roofs and exterior walls. It then hit a cul-de-sac on Cannon Court, completely leveling several houses. The tornado then trekked down a 120-foot hill, hitting the Decrescent Distributing Company and several other warehouses along North Main Street, including one of the two iconic town smokestacks. It then crossed the Hudson, continued east into Vermont, and damaged many homes in North Bennington, Vermont, as an F2. But I couldn't really find any images. All of the news crews were flooded flooding to Mechanicville. The tornado dissipated before the North Bennington Memorial Forest, located at an elevation of 2,800 feet in the Green Mountains. In a paper written by the National Weather Service in conjunction with the University at Albany, another non-atmospheric factor was identified that could have helped the formation of this particular tornado, terrain. Mechanicville is located in the northern Hudson River Valley. To the northwest are the Adirondacks, to the southwest the Catskills, and to the east the Green Mountains. Southerly wind at the surface was likely channeled through the Hudson River Valley, which converged with southwesterly flow over the Catskills right near Mechanicville. Localized areas of convergence can be huge factors in the birth of tornadoes, and they're often very difficult to see. Another factor that likely enhanced tornado genesis was the timing of the squall line overtaking the supercell. The interaction of an outflow boundary with a discrete supercell can often enhance vorticity, which is the spinning motion within storms. The Mechanicville tornado was just the beginning of the outbreak. The storm directly to the south dropped a short-lived F1 that crossed over the Albany airport 15 minutes later. While all this was happening in the eastern side of the state, discrete and embedded storms were firing off to the west of the squall line, in western New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and even eastern Indiana. Basically, everywhere along the cold front had the potential for severe weather, but upstate New York had the greatest potential for tornadoes. One of these storms developed near Erie, Pennsylvania, rode east along the New York state line for an hour, and then dropped a tornado west of Appalachian at 5.22 p.m. The structure of the supercell was very impressive, and the associated tornado would have the longest track of the day. It was pretty weak for about 20 miles, but intensified to an F2 south of Binghamton at around 6 p.m. It passed over the area of Ingram Hill, which sits about 800 feet above the town. Now, this was a good thing because it missed the most densely populated areas. However, typically in American cities, the highest points within a few mile radius of a population center is usually where we put all of our TV transmitters and radio broadcast towers. So you could probably guess what happened. 
Here, it hit the 200-foot transmitter tower for WNBF Radio. After that, it continued down the road and hit the WVIT News Channel 34 studio with a control operator and a trainee still inside. The 1,000-foot transmission tower collapsed and a steel dumpster was thrown into the satellite dishes out front. VHS tapes from the studio were found a mile away, as well as magnetic tape mangled in nearby trees. To the east, homes along Morgan, Pierce Creek, and Coleman Roads were heavily damaged. The tornado continued east through Windsor and Sanford, eventually hitting the small town of Deposit, ripping roofs off of homes. The tornado was on the ground for 62 miles and caused $2 million in damage. Four more F3 tornadoes occurred that day, including one way down south in the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania around 9 p.m. The storm in question was very close to the cold front, and the tornado hit the small town of Salisbury very hard, damaging 15 businesses, sweeping through the firehouse, and ripping the roof off of a furniture factory. The single fatality from this tornado unfortunately was a 13-year-old girl who was struck by a fallen church steeple inside of a van. And a few hours later, the cold front finally came through, putting an end to the outbreak. In total, 60 tornadoes occurred within those 48 hours of May 30th and 31st. Over 2 million people were without power, and many were in the dark for over a week. Luckily, there were only 13 deaths from the entire event. As for the immediate aftermath, Spencer did what it could as a community to rebuild, but with the tornado damaging 90% of the structures in town, less than half the population stayed in the town. It caused $18 million in damage, making it the most destructive tornado in South Dakota history and the second deadliest. Volunteer electricians from neighboring states worked around the clock in Wisconsin and Michigan to restore power to the affected areas, taking over a week in some cases. It was the largest power outage in Michigan state history up until that point in time. Mechanicville made pretty much a near full recovery and Salisbury did as well. But just two days later on June 2nd, Salisbury was heavily affected by yet another historic tornado outbreak. However, that's for another video. Now, let's talk about severe thunderstorm warnings. As someone once said, not all storms are created equal, so likewise, not all warnings should be the same. Take a look at one of the severe thunderstorm warnings for the 1998 duration. Ignoring the fact that 80 mile an hour winds is a low estimate, there's nothing in this warning that would make me want to take any sort of action. I just know that a line of storms is coming. If I actually knew what 80 mile an hour winds felt like, I'd probably be a bit more apprehensive, but keep in mind that this warning was issued at 1.10 a.m. People were asleep and they woke up with tree limbs poking through their ceiling. Now let's compare and contrast this with a warning from the Iowa Duratio of August 2020. Immediately, without even reading, we have a lot more information. The, hey, these are very dangerous storms, instantly catches my eye, and just below that, I can see that the hazard is 90 mile an hour winds, the source is a train spotter, so it must be legit, as if I would question the legitimacy of anything that the National Weather Service says, and the impact. I am in a life-threatening situation. Okay, strong words, you have my attention. Mobile homes will be heavily damaged or destroyed. Those are some bold but true claims. Homes and businesses will have substantial roof and wind damage. Well, let me just get out of my attic and get away from my bay windows. And look, we have an even more detailed list of locations. And hey, I know a guy in Davenport. Let me give him a call. Happen to be on the interstate? Never fear, we have a list of interstates with mile markers that are in the path of the storm. You better pull off into that flying J, get yourself a cup of coffee while the world ends around you. In case you still have no idea what to do, you're notified in a single sentence of the action you should take to protect your life. And finally, if you just don't want to read all that, you can skip to the bottom to see the abbreviated threats. Now, it's not a flawless system, but it won't ever be, and it's miles ahead of what it was in 1998. Severe thunderstorms are underrated and always will be. Many people fail to take action in a tornado emergency, let alone a tornado warning, let alone a severe thunderstorm warning. So the fact that the National Weather Service is able to include all this information in its weather warnings is fantastic. As for the storms of late May 1998, they truly were incredible and historic, but they probably will be outdone by a larger and longer lasting duration in the near future. As for the Northeastern High Risk, the Storm Prediction Center has gotten rightfully stingy with their high risks in the past decade, 
So this record might hold for a while. Thank you to Bill Reed for letting me use his footage of the Spencer tornado in my video. Please check out his awesome blog, Storm Bruiser. I especially like his write-up on the Spencer tornado because he mentions a lot of the technology that was available to storm chasers in the late 90s, and that was before my time. It's incredible how they managed to see as many tornadoes as they did back then. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy learning about weather in general, please like and subscribe. It really pushes this video out to other people and you'll get to see my future content. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you soon.